Well, I'm delighted today to be speaking to Andrew Telby Fox, who is CEO of Abacus Trust Group in Monaco. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you, David. Thank you for having me. So we're going to have a chat about the latest trends you're seeing in your business. But first of all, it'd be interesting to hear a little bit more about your background and, and a, a pen portrait, if you like, of the Abacus Trust Group. OK, thank you for that opportunity. Uh, well, I've been in the business um, of advising uh, international private clients and families for over 30 years now. Um, I started in the city of London working in tax, um, qualified as a chartered tax advisor. Some people might remember I was a partner in Smith & Williamson, as it was then, uh, and then more latterly um, a tax partner in Ernst & Young, running the private client um, arm of the business in the UK. Um, I then had a spell um, with Barclays Wealth um, in their international wealth advisory division. So that took me around the world to the, mm. the different locations. Um, and ended up running the trust uh, group for Barclays globally, um, taking it into the sale um, to what became Zedra. Mm. Uh, so it was a fairly natural uh, progression for me then to go and run another independent trust group, which is the Abacus Trust Group. Gives you a broad base of experience across, you know, tax, banking, fiduciary. Yes. It gives you a different view, yes, doesn't it? Yes, I'm very it? lucky so, yeah. to have had a varied and interesting career, yes. Fantastic. And, yes. and Monaco itself is an unusual place, isn't it? It's, it's a great place to yeah. come across and meet wealth, isn't it? Because clients yes. like to spend time there. Yeah. Uh, it, is that, is it, that part it, of the... It, it is a crossroads yeah. of, uh, yeah. of, of international wealth. You know, of course, for decades, um, it, it has been where people from all sorts of nationalities have gone to live um, for various reasons. Mm. Um, What's your observations on, on relocation into Monaco? Do you think that, is there any trends you can observe about, obviously people of wealth do move to Monaco, but is there, are there more now or less or what, yeah. what's your perspective? I mean, it's very difficult to get hard and fast yeah. data, but uh, I can say anecdotally that the stream of um, wealthy families moving to Monaco um, has continued unabated and mm. perhaps is even uh, increasing a little bit. In my business, we certainly see a lot of people um, coming to us for help with that uh, process of becoming um, resident and integrating into the community there. Because the relocation triggers the need for advice. They might look at their broader yes. affairs and they've obviously got the immediate need of how to actually become yes, resident. Yes, yes, quite so, yes. Yeah. And I imagine you often work with other intermediaries in oh. the wealth sector. Referrals could come from all sorts of angles. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. All the time, um, we, we uh, are lucky enough to have referrals from uh, firms in London, but also from banks and um, uh, intermediaries in you know all sorts of different countries. And we were chatting earlier about Dubai. As yes. a, there's a lot of press about Dubai attracting wealth, you mm. know, almost like wealth coming out of Europe and, and people becoming resident over there. I mean, yes. what's your perspective on what business going on in Dubai at the moment? Well, I think um, <clears throat> my observation would be that Dubai has made it, um, I don't like to use the word easy, but very smooth and frictionless for people to go there and become resident mm. and set up business there or set up their private um, offices there or, or, or indeed just to you know, base their, um, you know, their, their private lives there. Mm. Um, and um, that is, a, you know, if I think about my own business, um, that puts uh, Dubai in competition with Monaco, mm. for example. Um, and it's quite clear now that when uh, families or, or wealthy private clients are looking at possible different locations amongst the traditional ones of, say, Monaco, Switzerland, Italy, Spain, Portugal, etc., Dubai is, um, mm. is, is now there as a contender. And just looking at uh, the wealth structuring toolkit, as it were, yes. you know, your core business, companies, trust foundations. Yes, yes. How do you see those being used and applied today? Yes. Um, well, I sort of came out of the UK, the Anglo-Saxon system, if you like. So sure. um, it, it was a li little bit further into my career that I realised that around the world, trusts um, have been adapted and used in different ways. Um, such as you know the reserve powers in, in investment trusts uh, that one sees in different parts of the world. Mm. Um, but what I would say in general, though, is that um, the, the the types of client and family situations where trusts and companies and foundations, you know, what we typically refer to as structuring mm. um, for wealth, wealth transference, for tax efficiency, for asset protection. Um, 
ha has really started to become the preserve of the very, very wealthy. Um, because the, the, uh, the, the number of things that I would sort of call friction mm. um, that might get in the way of a decision to set up a trust or a, a company or a foundation, for example, um, have grown manifestly over the last few years. Mm. Um, what I'm really talking about there are things like um, compliance and regulation hurdles. Yeah. Um, the minimum fee has to be higher because the, the bur the, the, it's more burdensome to administer. And, and every year yeah. that something new is added. But in addition to that, I mean, there's a practical issue, which is that um, if you own an asset in a, a trust or a company or a trust and a company or in a foundation or something like that, the moment you try and do a transaction, um, everybody involved in that transaction wants to have a lot of due diligence mm. about the structure and, and all the components of it. Uh, and that uh, is time consuming, but, but also very expensive. Mm. Um, banks around the world in particular um, are you know, uh, very keen to make sure that um, no funds are moved or no transactions are executed without um, that uh, being in place. And you know, for a, uh, an active family, that can mean something every week or every mm. month, um, and it and it really adds up. So, yes, I think I think the um, you know the sort of the entry level has 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 gone up quite considerably over the last few years. And in in terms of jurisdictions you might use for client structuring options, I mean, there's yes. certain things you would do within Monaco, but I imagine it's sort of dovetailing advice and structuring across multiple jurisdictions. I mean, very much so. Very much so. What are the sort of what are some of the characteristics that would come up in terms of different jurisdictions you see being used? Well, I think <laughs> um, clients um, will, of course, have their own laundry list, and that yeah. might include, um, you know, what what are the asset protection laws like? Um, what are the um, what is the jurisprudence on um, fiduciary matters? Mm. That sort of thing, um, and then you know costs and mm. and ease of um, of dealing are, are another factor. Um, we, we ourselves in our group have a, a large trust and corporate administration business in the Isle of Man, for example. Mm. Um, but you know that, uh, that, that will look very similar in a way to, for instance, the Channel Islands. Um, and then you sort of look at jurisdictions like Switzerland, slightly different again, and then all of the, um, you know, the Caribbean and Asian jurisdictions, to name but some. <laughs> Do you find that the wealth owners that sort of congregate in Monaco are active in an entrepreneurial scene? Are people coming together and, although they've made money perhaps in a previous business, interested in, in deals and making things happen uh, uh, and active wealth? Uh, very, very much yeah. so, in fact. Uh, Monaco, I always think of Monaco as a bit of a village. Yeah. Um, and, you know, apart from the, um, the worker bees like myself, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a particular kind of village yeah. that you don't, you don't come across very often. Um, no, I mean, people, pe people who come to Monaco often have made their wealth through entrepreneurship. Mm. Um, and I've noticed that instead of sort of retiring and, you know, spending more time with their boats. And maybe with a younger profile coming to Monaco in the first correct, place. Correct. That's yeah. definitely changing. Yeah. Um, there are, I mean, the, the, the social side of Monaco really aids and abets um, people coming together to discuss mm. business. So I think a lot of deals are forged in Monaco, actually. And then they might look for structuring options like a co-invest and a fund structure oh, or something much so. like and that. They, and then they symbiotic. may need to reach out to um, jurisdictions like Luxembourg, Switzerland for banking and um, you know, um, EU um, sort of structuring options and that sort of thing. So it then spreads... Uh, outside into the uh, the wider community, yes. I mean, for professionals in Monaco, I mean, a, a lot of those based in the UK will see busy times of year like, um, you know, around yes. Mipim, around yes. the yacht show, yes. certain points of the year. But I mean, what's it like for, for the rest of the year, as it were? How do you characterise the professional scene in Monaco? Um, well, you've highlighted some of the the key events. <laughs> yeah. uh, you, of course, there's the Grand Prix as yeah, well. Absolutely. It, uh, yeah. So we have, the, we, we have the ATP tennis in April. Uh, we have the Grand Prix in May. Uh, we have the Yacht Show in September. And I, I, I don't want to sort of leave anything else out because there are a lot of other events going on, not just in Monaco, but as you say, in, yeah, uh, the, road, in, yeah. the, in the Riviera generally, yeah. like Mipim. Um, but there's always something happening um, yeah. around professional um, congregations. Um, so it's always busy. I mean, I think mm. the only time it goes a little bit quiet would be um, perhaps uh, the very short winter that we have um, down there. Um, but um, in terms of client activity, mm. um, we don't have quite the same drivers as perhaps there would be in, say, the UK with mm. the, um, the tax filing deadlines mm. and that sort of thing. 
So actually, the, um, the activity uh, amongst our clients tends to be spread a bit more uniformly uh, throughout the year, um, okay. apart from the, uh, the obvious uh, exception in the summer when, um, uh, as is well known, pretty much the whole of the Riviera closes down in, in August. Absolutely. And, and Not strictly true. <laughs> we, we, <laughs> I think we had our busiest August on record last year, but uh, in theory. And you're over here in London tonight. I, I um, imagine that London's a very important hub to meet other intermediaries where there is, is a yes. flow of people. Or I, I'll, I'll be very yeah. honest about this. Uh, London yeah. actually continues to be our most important intermediary hub. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of clients who have connections here or their other advisors here. Um, we think that many of the uh, best referrals of business into Monaco do still come from London. So hugely important to us. Um, and yes, very much looking forward to your event tonight. Fantastic. Well, look, Andrew, thank you for talking to me today. And I look forward to sharing this interview. Thank you.